8. Baker. Born in New York in 1826 and reared in the Michigan wilderness, Lafayette Baker engaged in mechanical and mercantile pursuits in the state of his birth and in Philadelphia in 1848 before departing in 1853 for California. Three years later, he was an active member of the Vigilance Committee. This experience and his admiration of Francois Vidocq, 1775 through 1857, an infamous Paris detective whom Baker came to imitate, whetted his appetite for intrigue and the life of the sleuth. When hostilities broke out between the North and the South, Baker happened to be heading for New York City on business. When he became aware of the mischief and misdeeds of Confederate spies and saboteurs in and around Washington, he set out for the capital, determined to offer his services as a Union agent. Footnote. See L.C. Baker, History of the United States Secret Service, Philadelphia, King and Baird, 1868, pages 15 through 20. Jacob Mogolever, Death to Traitors, The Story of General Lafayette C. Baker, Lincoln's Forgotten Secret Service Chief, New York, Doubleday and Company, 1960, pages 22 through 48. End footnote. Arriving in the District of Columbia, Baker obtained an interview with General Winfield Scott, commander of the Army and himself not unfamiliar with spy services. In need of information about the rebel forces at Manassas, Scott, having already lost five previous agents on the mission, solicited Baker's assistance. After an adventure of daring and dash, the intrepid Baker returned three weeks later with the details sought by General Scott. The success of the mission earned Baker a permanent position with the War Department. The next assignment given Baker involved ferreting out two Baltimore brothers who were running the Union blockade to supply munitions to the Confederates. This he did, breaking up the smuggling operation and earning himself a considerable amount of press publicity. These activities came to the attention of Secretary Seward, who hired Baker at the rate of $100 a month plus expenses and sent him off to prowl wherever espionage, sabotage, or rebel spy agents were thought to be lurking. Assisted by 300 Indiana cavalrymen, Baker was later ordered to probe the Maryland countryside for the presence of rebel agents and Confederate sympathies. His mission took him to Chaptico, Leonardstown, Port Tobacco, Old Factory, and the farmland of St. George's, St. Charles, and St. Mary's counties. As his column advanced, they punished the disloyal. As a result, quote, he left behind a trail of burning buildings, frightened men, women, and children, terrified informers, and bullet-pierced secesh tobacco planters, end quote. As a consequence of this campaign, Baker attempted to interest Postmaster General Montgomery Blair in a purge of disloyal Maryland postmasters, replacing them with Union stalwarts or closing the stations. Blair was well aware of disloyalty among some of the Maryland postmasters and earlier had ordered their displacement. In a report to the Secretary of State, Baker claimed he had obtained unlimited authority to conduct the postmaster purge and requested a military force of 200 to 300 men to police the localities in Maryland where these disloyal officials had been discovered. The proposal was ignored, but Baker had a variety of other tasks to occupy him as Seward's intelligence chief. Quote, With enough endurance for a dozen men, he worked almost without rest to educate himself in the ever-spreading operations of the rebels and their sympathizers. He traveled to Canada to see for himself what the South was doing to build a fire in the rear of the Union. He made the acquaintance of police chiefs on the big northern cities. He personally took prisoners to the harbor forts to look over conditions. He uncovered and jotted down identities of suppliers of war goods to the South. He acquired a first-hand knowledge of secesh supporting newspapers in sedition-ridden New York, New Jersey, and the seething West. Only on rare occasions, when official duty took him there, did he see his wife, Jenny, who had gone to the security of her parents' home in Philadelphia. End quote. 
As a consequence of Lincoln's St. Valentine's Day directive regarding the release of political prisoners and limiting extraordinary arrests to, quote, the direction of the military authorities alone, end quote, Baker was recommended to the War Department and its new secretary, Edwin M. Stanton. In accepting Baker's services, Stanton warned him of the grave and desperate situation facing the government, advised him that he would never be permitted to disclose the authority for his actions, and gave notice that he would be expected to pursue all enemies of the Union, regardless of their station, power, loyalty, partisanship, or profession. Baker's detective service was to be the terror of the North as well as the South, secretly funded and accountable exclusively and directly to the Secretary of War. Quote, the enemies of the state took many forms. An enemy could be a pretty girl with swaying hips covered by an acre of crinoline, carrier of rebellion-sustaining contraband goods. Or an enemy could be a contractor selling the Union shoddy clothing. Or an enemy could be a copperhead sapping the strength of the Union by discouraging enlistments. An enemy could also be a Union general with larceny in his soul gambling away the pay of his soldiers. He could be a guerrilla with a torch firing a government corral within sight of the White House. End quote. For three years, Baker gathered intelligence on the enemies of the Union, reporting his findings to Stanton and Lincoln. In addition, at their direction or sometimes on his own authority, he functioned as an instrument for directly punishing the enemy or for arresting and incarcerating them. Utilizing his intelligence sources, Baker identified and prejudged the despoilers of the Union, relying upon extraordinary military authority and martial law. He seized his foe in his capacity as a federal policeman, and as the custodian of the old Capitol prison and its nefarious annex, the Carroll prison, he served as jailer of those he captured. Of Baker's commander in chief, one authority has commented. Quote, no one can ever know just what Lincoln conceived to be limits of his powers. End quote. In his own words, the 16th president wrote, quote, My oath to preserve the Constitution to the best of my ability imposed upon me the duty of preserving, by every indispensable means, that government, that nation, of which that Constitution was the organic law. Was it possible to lose the nation? and yet preserve the Constitution. By general law, life and limb must be protected, yet often a limb must be amputated to save a life, but a life is never wisely given to save a limb. I felt that measures otherwise unconstitutional might become lawful by becoming indispensable to the preservation of the Constitution through the preservation of the nation. Right or wrong, I assumed this ground and now avow it. I could not feel that, to the best of my ability, I had ever tried to preserve the Constitution if, to save slavery or any minor matter, I should permit the wreck of government, country, and Constitution altogether. End quote. And in the more contemporary view of Clinton Rossiter, quote, Mr. Lincoln subscribed to a theory that, in the absence of Congress and in the presence of an emergency, the president has the right and duty to adopt measures which would ordinarily be illegal, subject to the necessity of subsequent congressional approval. He did more than this. He seemed to assert that the war powers of the Constitution could, upon occasion, devolve completely upon the president, if their exercise was based upon public opinion and an inexorable necessity. They were then sufficient to embrace any action within the fields of executive or legislative or even judicial power essential to the preservation of the Union. He implied that this government, like all others, possessed an absolute power of self-defense, a power to be exerted by the President of the United States, and this power extended to the breaking of the fundamental laws of the nation if such a step were unavoidable." End quote. The presence of this operating viewpoint at the highest level of the executive branch, coupled with his own personal ambitions for power and prestige, 
contributed significantly to Baker's zealous, authoritarian, and often illegal manner of carrying out his War Department mission. Nevertheless, Baker must be recognized as a professional, thoroughly familiar with the methods and tactics of his profession. Reflecting a classically Machiavellian perspective, he once wrote, quote, It may be said that the deception and misstatements resorted to and inseparable from the detective service are demoralizing and prove unsoundness of character in its officers. But it must be borne in mind that, in war, no commander fails to deceive the enemy when possible, to secure the least advantage. Spies, scouts, intercepted correspondence, feints in army movements, misrepresentations of military strength and position are regarded as honorable means of securing victory over the foe. The work of the detectives is simply deception reduced to a science or profession. And whatever objection on ethical grounds may lie against the Secret Service lies with equal force against the strategy and tactics of Washington, Scott, Grant, and the host of their illustrious associates in the wars of the world. War is a last and terrible resort in the defense of even a righteous cause, and sets at defiance all of the ordinary laws and customs of society, overriding the rights of property and the sanctity of the Sabbath. And not until the nation learns war no more will the work of deception and waste of morals, men, and treasures cease. End quote. Establishing offices at 217 Pennsylvania Avenue, in close proximity to both the White House and the War Department, Baker began gathering recruits and organizing his unit. Operating without official status, the group was generally referred to as the Secret Service Bureau. Its personnel, known only to Baker in terms of number and complete identity, bore no credentials other than a small silver badge. Secretly commissioned as a colonel, Baker initially represented himself, when absolutely necessary, as an agent of the War Department. Later, he publicly cited his military rank and held the title of Provost Marshal. Quote, he initiated the nation's first police dossier system, although the rebels, the copperheads, and the misguided among the loyalists in the North charged him with poking his private eyes into the homes of the innocent. He gathered systematically the first criminal photo file, enabling a more efficient pursuit of the enemies of the nation. He instituted a policy of seizing suspects in the dead of night when their resistance to interrogation and their ability to seek help would be at the lowest ebb. He made a science of the interrogation of prisoners, using teams of detectives to work over a suspect until he was satisfied he either had the full story or he could drag no more information from his victim. He established a secret fund for building and feeding a vast army of informers and unlisted agents. No one except he knew the full range of his organization. Even his most trusted aides were not allowed to know the identity of all of his operatives. End quote. For reasons of both security and strategy, Baker's agents were divided into daylight and nighttime units. The men in one group did not know the identity of those in the other, and another section counted operatives who infiltrated and trafficked in the capital's high society. He cultivated contacts with the police in the nation's major cities and kept a close watch on Confederate activities in Canada. By the summer of 1863, a branch office had been set up in New York City, and he succeeded in placing his personnel in the post office for purposes of inspecting the mails. On two occasions, Baker's spy service gathered intelligence which probably contributed to the downfall of General McClellan. Baker's personal penetration of the Confederate forces at Manassas resulted in the discovery that the fortifications and artillery which were supposedly keeping McClellan's army at bay were actually earthen and wooden fakes, and later Lincoln utilized the services of one of Baker's agents to secretly observe McClellan's conduct on the battlefield. With the decline of McClellan, Alan Pinkerton, whom Baker regarded as sagacious, departed from the scene, leaving some agents and the spy field to Baker. <laughs> 
The only other threat to Baker's supreme command of Secret Service operations was the reputed organizer of the old Mexican spy company, Ethan Allen Hitchcock. But he was found to be an old man seized with mysticism and pursuits of alchemy, with no desires for any responsibilities in the hostilities. In June of 1863, Baker gained an open commission in the Army with the rank of colonel, the opportunity to wear the Union uniform and command of a military police force he had sought for some time. The exact size of the unit is not known, or its losses, or its complete record of action. After much pressuring from Baker, Stanton agreed to establish the troop, utilizing authority entitling the District of Columbia to a battalion of infantry and cavalry for use within its confines. Footnote. Mogleaver, page 214. The District of Columbia had only one cavalry unit during the Civil War, but counted the 1st and 2nd Regiment Infantry, serving from 1861 until 1865, and several short-lived infantry battalions and militia companies, which were hastily organized in 1861 and mustered out by the end of the year. End footnote. Placed under the direct authority of the Secretary of War, the 1st Regiment Cavalry, known as Baker's Rangers, consisted, ironically, of recruits from Robert E. Lee's former command, the 2nd Dragoons, renamed the 2nd Regular United States Cavalry at the outbreak of the war. Quote, Hundreds of men sought places in the new regiment. Some offered bribes. Whether the attraction was the promise that no soldier in the Baker Command would ever be sent outside the immediate vicinity of the District of Columbia, or whether Baker's fame inspired all types of adventurers to flock to his banner, was the subject of much conjecture at that time. End quote. In an appeal to the governor of New York, Baker wrote, quote, The duties to be performed by this regiment demand on the part of both men and officers qualities of a high order, both mental and physical. Among these, I may enumerate intelligence, sobriety, self-dependence, bodily vigor, the power of endurance, and, though last, not least, that knowledge of the horse which results from early practical experience and management of that noble animal. End quote. The personal qualifications of Baker's recruits, of course, cannot be assessed. By their actions, however, they demonstrated great military ability, intense loyalty to their commander, and a complete insensitivity to the property, liberties, and lives of those they encountered as enemies. For reasons of high morality and public image, the Rangers were unleashed upon the gambling parlors and vice dens of Washington. Soon, however, they began engaging in forays of destruction against enemies of the Union beyond the confines of the Capitol. The Rangers were an auxiliary to Baker's intelligence activities. They were his agents of espionage, enforcement, and protection. Secret operatives gathered information in both the cities and the countrysides of the Potomac region. Baker devoured their reports, conferred with Stanton and or Lincoln, and then set out with enforcements against the subversives. In addition to ferreting out spies, blockade runners, and locals giving aid and comfort to the rebels, Baker engaged in three major intelligence enterprises, unmasking crimes in the Treasury Department, smashing the Northwest Conspiracy, and capturing the President's assassin. Footnote. Baker's own account of his Bureau's activities and his troops' adventures is thin, and compared with the Mogliver account, which relies on Baker's correspondence and the letters and diaries of relatives, fails to convey the questionable nature of their operations or their possible illegality. See Baker, pages 147 through 198, 230 through 241, 253 through 261, 329 through 378, and 384 through 452. End footnote. The opportunity to probe the Treasury Department regarding allegations that it had become a body house and command post for certain predatory interests arose around Christmas 1863, when Treasury Secretary Salmon P. Chase invited Baker to investigate the situation. Quote, There was growing talk of scandals in the Treasury Department. Newspapers were saying that the hundreds of girls busy scissoring the new greenbacks were hussies in the night. 
There were oyster feasts in the bonnet room. Clerks were making off with sheets of uncut currency. Counterfeiters were discovering it was easier to steal a plate and run off bales of money rather than go to the trouble of making an imitation engraving in some hideaway. The Treasury's own police seemed helpless to stem the tide of corruption and debauchery. The Blair family, avowed enemies of Chase, were giving support to the rumors. Postmaster General Montgomery Blair's brother, Frank, cried out for congressional inquiry. End quote. Footnote. Mogulever, page 249. In 1863, Congress authorized the Secretary of the Treasury to appoint three revenue agents to aid in the prevention, detection, and punishment of frauds upon the revenue. These were the small beginnings of the Treasury Department's intelligence organization and the only designated investigative force available to the Secretary at the time of the Baker Inquiry. End footnote. The probe was charged and politically explosive. Seward, eyes upon the 1864 election and the White House beyond, might well have wanted Lincoln's top detective mired in the scandals, diffused, and defamed along with most of the administration. In Hanson A. Risley, special treasury agent, Seward had his own source of intelligence. So close were the two men that Risley gave over one of his daughters to Seward for adoption, and after Mrs. Seward's death, the old man sought her for his second wife. In detailing Baker to Treasury, Stanton probably thought he would be the best man to vindicate the president as untainted, honest, and ignorant of the conditions there. Himself a frequent critic of Lincoln, the Secretary of War nevertheless realized that public confidence in the president must be maintained in the midst of the moment's perils, and he might well have been aware that Lincoln had no direct involvement in the Treasury calamities. Factions within Congress were ready to intervene to attack Lincoln, Chase, and Baker. Ultimately, a committee of investigation was formed, probed the situation, and beclouded the facts and the guilt of those involved. Baker plunged into the Treasury probe with ferocity and determination. He temporarily relinquished command of the raiders and established an office in the dark basement of the Treasury building. His techniques were direct and dauntless. He stalked the printing facilities and subjected clerks and lesser officials to ruthless and merciless interrogation. At one juncture, he halted a funeral cortege in the midst of the city, seized the corpse of a treasury girl, and had an examination made to determine if her death had resulted from an abortion. And what did Baker find? At the outset, he discovered that young James Cornwell, who had the function of burning mutilated bonds and notes, had pocketed $2,000 worth of notes. Cornwall was convicted and sent to jail for this offense, the only individual to be prosecuted for crimes against the Treasury in this probe. Next, Baker alleged that two printers who had sold the Treasury new presses, paper, and a technique for printing currency were conspiring to sell the government worthless machinery and processes. Their presses were weakening the upper floors of the Treasury building, and their security procedures were virtually non-existent, allowing ready access to both plates and process. In the midst of the inquiry, the new presses began malfunctioning, and greater demands were placed on the building for improved printing devices. Baker discovered that the head of the Department of Printing and Engraving, Spencer Clark, was involved with the number of young women who were cutting and preparing new currency. An associate of Clark's was also implicated, and both men were named for dismissal by Baker. Eventually, it came to pass that it was Secretary Chase who was to resign, and the great Treasury scandal passed into history. In mid-November of 1863, a full month before the Treasury investigation got underway, Rumors of a dangerous conspiracy along the Canadian border began circulating. Baker's agents pursued the facts of the matter, and by late spring of the following year, a fairly clear image of the attack planned by the Confederates was evident. In Richmond, Judah P. Benjamin, Secretary of State for the rebel government, a holder of three cabinet posts in the Confederacy, and a man of imagination, conceived a desperate plan of havoc. 
utilizing secret societies reminiscent of the later Ku Klux Klan, guerrilla warriors behind Union lines would burn down New York City, free rebel troops imprisoned in the North to loot and pillage throughout the industrial Northeast, and seize Chicago, Buffalo, and Indianapolis. The plan failed to recognize the drift of Northern morale. Those disenchanted with the war still supported Lincoln, sought the Union as was, and the Constitution as is, and otherwise had no interest in or sympathy for a separate Confederate nation. In the aftermath of the destructive campaigns of Generals Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley and Sherman in Georgia, the rebels were ready for unconventional warfare of their own making. The Copperhead firebrand Clement Vallandigham was recruited to obtain support for a new nation composed of states adjacent to the Canadian border. Army officers in civilian dress were dispatched north to act as terrorists. The first target for revenge was Chicago. Assembled in Toronto, the band of insurgents made their plans, all of which were carefully recorded by a Baker informer. Commanders of military prisons were informed of these developments and advised to be prepared for uprisings within or attacks from outside of their institutions. Baker advanced a squadron of agents to Toronto to maintain surveillance of the conspirators who were followed and observed as they straggled into Chicago in the midst of the Democratic National Convention. More than 2,000 civilian-clad Confederate soldiers were scattered around the city. At the height of the convention proceedings, the area would be put to the torch. While police and firemen fought the flames, an attack would be made on Camp Douglas and its prisoners freed. The banks would be looted, city hall seized, and the police headquarters occupied. Thus, the second largest city in the land was to fall to rebel control. Politics among the conspirators caused a postponement of their assault until Election Day. After reassembling in Toronto, Burnings and attacks on local authorities were scheduled for simultaneous occurrence in Chicago, New York, Cincinnati, and Boston. Still, the surveillance of these preparations continued, and still flowed the informer's details to Baker. Offensive actions were unleashed against the terrorists. Without warning, General Benjamin F. Butler, seasoned in maintaining the security and serenity of New Orleans, marched into New York with 10,000 Union troops as the clock moved toward Election Day. Confederate arsonists abandoned their grandiose plan of havoc, set a few fires in some hotels, which were quickly extinguished, and fled to Canada. Across the border, they soon learned that they had been fortunate in their escape. A Baker spy in Chicago brought about the ruination of terrorist activities in that city, and a Union operative in Indiana gathered enough information to implicate almost the entire band of Confederate conspirators in that state. While these elements were being rounded up and jailed, Union authorities took an imprisoned Confederate officer into their intelligence corps, swore him to loyalty to the Union cause, and released him to make contact with some of the remaining members of the Northwest Conspiracy. Followed by Baker's agents, the man soon met with a group seeking to liberate 3,000 rebel officers incarcerated on Johnson's Island in Lake Michigan. The intervention of this spy cost the conspirators a cache of arms and the loss of a few men in Chicago, and indirectly contributed to the scuttling of the Johnson's Island mission. By late fall 1864, the Northwest Conspiracy had collapsed, and its principal leaders and organizers had been jailed. Quote, the excitement and stimulation of the chase ended. Baker found himself in a now familiar situation. He was given no public credit for his part in smashing the great conspiracy. On the contrary, his enemies increased their efforts to build up the ugly image of the Bastille master, and he continued to be identified in the public mind with unjust arrests and imprisonments, invasions of the rights of private persons, and rumored profiteering. Baker still knew that, as a secret agent, the details of his activities must remain secret. If, however, he had hoped that this sensational case would change the attitude toward him in Congress and administration circles, or would convince the Copperheads that he put the Union before personal gain, 
he must have been sadly disappointed. His success in securing and transmitting information which led to the dramatic collapse of the Great Conspiracy and the punishment of its leaders in the North still brought him no evidence that his services were to be fairly judged by the results he achieved for the Union cause. End quote. Baker had just completed a successful investigation of fraud and deception surrounding the draft, bounty hunting, defrauding sailors out of prize money, and efforts at morally corrupting Union troops in the New York City area when he received the news of Lincoln's assassination. Undoubtedly, he felt guilt for not having had advance information about the conspiracy against the president and for not having had agents near the chief executive when the murderer struck. Upon receiving word that Lincoln had been shot and was dead, Baker threw himself into the pursuit and capture of those responsible for the crime. After producing a handbill, the first to be circulated for a nationally wanted criminal, describing John Wilkes Booth in detail, Baker set about interrogating everyone and anyone who knew anything about the conspirators involved in the assassination. Quote, Stanton went along with the detective's thinking and supported his tigerish moves to stalk his prey. One by one, Booth's accomplices were rounded up. Baker's rival police agencies did most of the work. But he took charge of the prisoners, dragged incriminating admissions from them, put black hoods on their heads, and stuffed them in the hold of a monitor in the river. End quote. Finally, Baker found Booth's track, pursued him with a command of cavalry, and came at last to the Garrett farm where the assassin had taken refuge in a barn. His prey cornered, Baker confronted the killer, demanded his surrender or the alternative of firing the barn. In the midst of negotiations and flames, Booth was shot by either himself or by Sergeant Boston Corbett. Baker took charge of the body and later sought a portion of the rewards for capturing Booth. The amount subsequently awarded Baker was reduced to $3,750 from a potential of $17,500. The Secret Service chief continued to be unpopular with the Congress. With the death of Lincoln, Baker became the protector of the new president, Andrew Johnson, and set up the first White House Secret Service detail in the history of the Republic. With the peace of Appomattox, however, the career of the spy chief began to rapidly decline. The rebel foe of wartime now walked the streets of the capital. Many of the prostitutes and gamblers Baker had jailed under military law were again free. These, together with political enemies, taunted and reproached the once powerful Secret Service, a vestige of war which seemed to have no future mission. Nevertheless, Baker attempted to carry on in the old style. His task was to protect the president. His immediate foe, he surmised, were various female pardon brokers, lately sympathetic to the South, who prevailed upon the president to grant clemency and forgiveness to all manner of rebels. In attempting to halt this traffic in and out of the White House, Baker incurred the wrath of President Johnson and a lawsuit which successfully damaged his status and role. In the midst of the trial, he was routinely mustered out of the army and effectively left without a friend or defender. He departed Washington in disgrace, returned to his wife in Philadelphia, wrote his memoirs in lieu of finding other work, contracted spinal meningitis, and died on the evening of July 3, 1868. Lafayette Baker was a zealot who, imbued with a strong sense of righteousness and a taste of vigilantism, in the name of a cause became oblivious to the ends-means relationship underlying his function. In his defense of the Union and democratic government, he resorted to extreme actions obnoxious to popular rule and, in some instances, in violation of constitutional guarantees. He actively sought to exceed his intelligence role and became policeman, judge, and jailer. His desires in this regard and his capacity for achievement of same were fostered and fed by the exigencies of the moment and the liberties Lincoln took in administering or not administering the law. When Lincoln died and the war ended, Baker became a political pariah with a vestigial function. His activities had annoyed many, frightened some, and made bitter enemies of an important and powerful few. In 
with the onset of peace in the nation, he was virtually stripped of his organization and official status and left vulnerable to legal, political, and financial reprisals. These forces converged, coalesced, and crushed. Due to the secret nature of Baker's operations and his tendency to embellish fact, the full account of the activities of this spy chief may never be known. In all likelihood, his record of service will always be controversial and of debatable value. This is Our Hidden History.